model of React. And with the new latest version, we're really loving it. Like we're going all in on this technology. So what it is, right? It's a four corners of a chessboard. Rooks. Uh, nope, nope, sorry. I think that's a wrong thing. Yeah, hooks, hooks, yes. So today we'll be talking about hooks, uh, how they work and how to use them effectively. So first of all, what are hooks, right? So hooks were released in October 2018 at RedCon. So it has been roughly six to seven months. So I'm pretty sure all of you have at least heard about hooks, right? Uh, can you give a raise up of the hand? How many of you guys are using hooks right now? Okay, that's like one third. Okay, that's pretty good. So for those who aren't familiar with React hooks, it is 11 new functions uh, released by React and all this combined together form the concept of hooks, right? So there are 11 and we only have 20 minutes. So that's unfortunately not enough time. So we're gonna do what Thanos did and gonna cut it in half. We're gonna talk about this five hooks, right? Use state, use effect, and so on. So to start with hooks, you need to understand the basic rules. One, you can only call them at the top level, which means you can't call hooks with if else of for loops or within other functions. And the second thing is you can only call hooks from React functions. This means no class components. When I first heard of this, it sort of bewildered me and I went, why? Like this rule seems quite arbitrary to what we're familiar with. As programmers, we should be able to call functions whenever and however, right? So I went to dug into the source code to find out how they actually work underneath. So on mounts, what is going to happen is whenever you call a hook, it is going to store a value within a box in React. And when you call a second one, it sort of puts the value in a second box, sort of like an array or a linked list, and so on. On re-render, meaning on update, whenever you call a new hook, React is going to look at the first box and return the first value. Similarly, for the second hook, it's going to look at a second box and give you the second value, and so on. So what happens if we violate the rules? Well, if you call an if-else condition and on an end render, the second hook is going to miss out or not be called. React is still going to look at the second box and give you the value for the second hook. And obviously, this is wrong. And on the next call, React's going to be, hey, there's supposed to be a third hook, but it's not there. So I'm just going to throw an error. And that is indeed what happens. All right, so now that we know the rules, let's look at how we can use hooks. The simplest hook is use state which is a combination of this dot state and this dot set state that we're so used to within class components. So we can see that when you call react.useState, what it is doing is giving you an array for which the first value is a value of the state and the second value is a function for you to mutate or set the new state similar to set state that you're also used to. And to demonstrate, I have a demo here. So this is a very simple input, right? Where we have value name and set name. So on change, we're going to call set name with the value of the target to uppercase. So this is just a very simple demonstration that hooks do indeed work because it does. So what is the difference between use state and this dot set state? There is actually a very clear distinction. So 
So in this second demo, what I have is three set states, or sorry, two, three set states with hooks. So the first call, I'm going to set object with a equals to two. But we, you do realize that there's both A and B keys. So when I only set A, what it's go, React is going to do is override the values. So it is different from this dot set state because it does not merge the values for you, like the original class this dot set state. On, and the second set state, what it is doing is it is spreading the values of object. <coughs> And here we see that A and B are updated and still remain there. There is a third way that you can do so via callback, which is very similar to this dot set state. So that is use state. So the second hook is use effect, and it is very similar to component date mount or component date update. So here on the right, you can see that there is use effect, right, where we are trying to mutate document.title. So one important thing to realize is use effect takes in a second argument. Over here, I put in an empty array. So this array, conceptually, I like to think of it more like dependencies. Right? What does use effect depend on? Over here is an empty array, so it depends on nothing. So what this means is it only runs on mount. So let's look at a demo. Right. So for our first component, our use effect has undefined as a second argument. So what is going to happen is on use effect, it is going to call set counter. Set counter triggers a re render. Re render calls use effect. Use effect calls set counter triggers a re render, so on and so forth. So that's why the count is going up so fast, as you can see. So why do we have to be careful? Right now, this is just a set counter. But if you are using, say, something like a REST API, well, by this time, it's going to get caught 120,000 times. Yep. Your API limits will go through the roof if you're not careful. So what happens if we pass in an empty array as a second argument? It's only, over, it's only going to get caught on mount. So it's going to trigger once. And here we can see that counter is 1. On a more complicated example, we're going to have use effect depend on this variable called step. So step is going to increment by 1 every time I click on this button. But Whenever a step changes, it also triggers a use effect, which triggers a set state. And so we see that instead of count going up by its original value, it's going up by 3, 6, 10, 15, 21, sort of like Fibonacci. And this is sort of like a cascading effect of use effect that we can all use and depend on. So how do we unmount things, right? For use effect, you can return a callback. So whenever it is unmounted or when the dependencies are changed, use effect callback is going to be called and it will trigger. So on the right, there is a very typical example where you would mount an event listener and unmount an event listener. When I first started using use effect, I, this thing sort of got me where uh, as compared to class life cycles like component did mount, component did update, and component will unmount, right? It actually triggers before the browser paints. So I will demonstrate this with a demo later. But what use effect does is it triggers after the browser paints. So I have a demo here where on initial text is a very long chunk of text, and on component did mount, 
I'm going to set state and say, set it to component did mount fired. So if I click on it multiple times, you realize that you don't ever see the initial text. But I have a use effect function here. And it does mostly the same thing, but you do find that, hey, the initial text appears for one frame and disappears. And that is indeed what is happening because remember that use effect fires after the browser pins. Yep. So how do we manage that if you want the original behavior? Well, there is this book called use layout effect, which does what component did mount and component did update do in the past. Right? So let's sort of run through all of the effects that we've learned so far. So on mount, what's going to happen is uh, it is going to run your react.lazy stuff and it is going to render react later updates the DOM then runs the layout effects browser paints the result of it then, <coughs> then it runs the effects of use effect on update it will render react will update the DOM clean up layout effects run layout effects paint clean up effects, run effects. On unmount, it is going to do uh, a very simple thing of just cleaning up all the things. Now, for those who are careful, they realize that use effect actually fires before use effect. Uh, sorry, I mean the clean up effect fires before use effect, right? And this was why I thought too, that my mental model was React would call use effect then call the callback, then the next render happens. But that is actually not what's happening. React would instead fire use effect, then on the next render, it will call your callback. So it is sort of conceptually confusing because whenever it calls a callback, it's actually calling the previous render's callback. Yeah. For those who are unclear on this, it would be useful for you to, uh, and this is sort of an edge case, so it really comes up, but if you just have uh, two use effects, you will be able to understand what's happening before and after. Right, our fourth hook, use wrap. So for those that have used create wrap before, this is very similar. You're going to create a wrap, and later on when you use it, you can just put it within your uh, React element and it will work as per normal. So to demonstrate this, I have a form, an uncontrolled component in which you would pass a ref into the component and then later manipulate it somehow. So over here, I put in a file input ref and following, I'm going to get the first file when I click submit, which is indeed what is happening here. So there is a second way that you can use use ref, which is sort of like a class instance variable. And on the right, you can see like a very typical kind of thing where use it use effect, uh, sorry, use ref is holding a ID of set interval and later on we're going to call the callback and clear interval. So this is how you normally write a clock in use uh, in hooks. So how would you, so in Normal class components, this is how you write it. Right. Right, you would set this dot ID equals to set interval and perhaps on component will unmount. 
you would call clear interval. And as per normal, you render how you would do this. Yep. But one thing to be careful is use wrap is different from all your normal state. So it is safe. You should be careful to treat it like a side effect. So in the future versions of React where you have uh, concurrent mode, or even right now, with if you are using strict mode, this is what you would happen if you don't treat use ref as a side effect. So I have a bad counter that simply treats it treats uh, use ref like a variable, and I have a good counter that actually uses use effect and treat it like an effect. So if I click update once, good counter goes up to two, but bad counter goes up to three. And it sort of deviates from what you would normally expect. Here I'm using strict mode. So what's happening? Uh, React is going to re-render more than just once in the future versions. So what is happening is if you don't treat it as a side effect, right? Uh, there are going to be multiple renders, or rather more renders that you would normally expect. And this is what causes this weird behavior. The final hook that we're going to talk about today is use context. So use context is pretty simple. We are going to use create a context here. After that, we are going to call react.useContext to get the value of color in this instance. And to demonstrate how it works, I'm going to have uh, color value here that is being passed down in context. And when I click switch color, it's going to update. So color is not receiving any props, but it is updating from context. There is a catch though, because there is going to be some performance issues. So in this next demo, I have I have a team in which background is a constant, so it never changes, but it's being passed down through the same context. And in background color, I'm only ever using background. So what is happening if I click switch color? Do you realize that a count is going up even though background color remains the same value? And that's because whenever context updates, it triggers re-renders in all the components that uses this context. So how do you deal with this? There are three methods. First, you can either split up context, you can use react.memo, or you can use a third hook called react.useMemo. I won't go into this because they are fairly complicated, and it is quite rare that you are going to need them because of this fourth method. So this is an Easter egg that I found while going through the source code, and I saw that there's going to be like this cool new function where you're going to set bits to update and allow React to update based on the bits. And this is really arcane to me. And I saw that, hey, this seems like a new feature that React is going to announce soon in the future. So I wouldn't recommend going through the three methods to pre-optimize yet, just in case you know this comes out soon. So how do we test hooks? So for those that have used hooks before, right, React has released this new function called act. And there is a long extensive document that explains how act works and how to use it for testing. I won't go into to it too much. But what it is is you can use, as compared to a normal function, when you render something, you're going to call act. And act will basically flush out all the effects and make sure that by the end of your expect statement, all the use effects, use layout effects, are going to be finished when it happens. So if you are using enzyme, uh, this enzyme, 
it is going to get slightly more complicated. Aside from simply using egg, you also need to use mount, uh, where because shallow won't do. And in addition to using to mount, you need to call wrapper.update to update them. There is a third library called React Testing Library. The name is rather straightforward, and so is their testing. So it is very simple. All you have to do is import render and simply render it. What's going on underneath is render already calls act for you. So you don't have to do any of those magic stuff. Yep, and that's all. Thank you. So, uh, any questions? There's swag. To be yes. I'm trying to use a hooks in your production code. I'm just playing a lot. Uh, yeah. So we we at Zendesk we do use hooks and we actually are migrating a lot of stuff over to hooks. And the reason why is because hooks, in addition to being simpler to use, it is also uh, less complex to maintain, and it helps really reduce the amount of logic that goes underneath, especially if you are using things like render props, where if you have multiple of them, it will sort of be like this pyramid of doom. And if you use hooks, since it requires everything to be at the top level, it's just one straight line. It's yep. Yes. For current, if let's say our current uh, application is using Redux with fast component syntax, is it suggesting us to use hooks? I mean, how 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 can this come in the picture with Redux? Yeah. So with Redux, you would normally use something like with Redux, where you would call. Uh, I mean, sorry, I'm assuming you're using React Redux library with this. Yes. So with Redux, it's going to be a HOC. So within the HOC, it can still be a class component. It can also be a functional component, in which case you can continue to use hooks. Yeah. But uh, React Redux currently does not have a hook counterpart, and that's because of certain issues uh, relating to use context that I mentioned. Any more questions? All right, thank you.